record. There we go. So what is shock? So shock is uh, if you go in the wards and uh, you're new to the wards, you keep on hearing the word shock. Uh, okay, this patient's in shock. This patient's in shock. What does that mean? So shock is a life-threatening condition. If you don't treat it, the patient will most likely die if you don't do anything. And the reason why shock is so important is because if you imagine your body, you have several different organs. And if you have one organ that doesn't get enough blood flow, okay, it will not get enough oxygen, okay? If you don't have enough oxygen to that one specific organ, then that organ will die. Now imagine, this happens to your entire body. So one organ doesn't get enough oxygen, that will eventually lead to multi-organ failure. So if you, for example, have your heart not getting enough oxygen or not enough, getting enough blood, then that will, in time, in due time, that will cause uh, multi-organ failure. So your lungs won't get enough and your kidneys, your liver, etc. So that's why it's really important to spot shock. And the way you spot shock is, uh, mainly by three things, okay? Uh, but the main the main two that I want you guys to focus on is the urinary output. So if you have a low urine output, less than 0 0.5 mils per kilograms per hour, then you would have a person that, then this would sort of indicate that a person is shocked. And the second most important thing is the blood pressure. And the blood pressure, the, the main thing you need to focus on is the systolic, less than 90, okay? I'll talk about the mean arterial pressure uh, uh, soon enough. And the third thing is uh, the symptoms. So if they're pale, they're cool, or they're sweaty, then uh, that's an indication that the person is shock because there's not enough perfusion throughout the body. Okay. Now this is the this is a, an equation that I really want you guys to focus on because it's uh, it's an important thing uh, to to see if um, sorry I'm just trying to admit people. There you go. Right, there we go. Okay. So so this is the uh, main equation I want you to focus on. So mean arterial pressure is the cardiac output times by systemic vascular resistance. So I'm sure, th th uh, I, I don't know if you've heard about this equation or not, but the reason why I'm talking about maths and uh, equations is because if you understand this equation, you will understand what shock is. Okay. So if you have the uh, the blood pressure, the normal blood pressure, you have two different readings. So you have systolic and you have diastolic. The mean arterial pressure is different. It's uh, it's the average blood pressure throughout your whole entire body, and uh, it takes that uh, it takes two different things into account. So it takes the amount of blood that's being pumped by the heart, and also the resistance of the blood vessels. Okay, so what does that mean? So if you have the, let's focus on the cardiac output first, okay? So the cardiac output is the heart rate times by stroke volume, okay? The cardiac output is the amount of blood that's pumped throughout the, uh, to, through the entire body uh, by the heart, okay? So if you have the heart rate, okay? Your heart rate is the number of beats per minute. So let's say an average person, it's around 80 beats per minute. Your stroke volume is the amount of blood that's pumped with each beat, okay? So if you have the heart rate and you multiply that by the stroke volume, so the beats per minute times by the how much volume your heart is pumping, you get the cardiac output. I'm not gonna go into numbers just because it's too confusing. But uh, the main thing is you get the cardiac output. Now, what's important with the stroke volume is you have the preload and the contractility. The preload is how much the heart can relax and the contractility is how much the heart can pump blood. So the systole, okay? So diastolic is preload, uh, systolic is contractility, okay? Now, why is this important? I'll go into it just the next slide, uh, but uh, the main thing is you need to know is, okay, the cardiac output is uh, what the heart is doing. The systemic vascular resistance is how much resistance the entire body is going through, okay? Now, the main two types of shock uh, that I categorize them into is distributive and non-distributive, okay? So with a distributive, there's a problem with the systemic vascular resistance. The systemic vascular resistance decreases, causing vasodilation, okay? So there's a, uh, the blood vessels dilate. And in non-distributive, you get a problem with the cardiac output, so, the on, so on the other end. So you get a decrease in the cardiac output 
So the heart isn't pumping enough blood, essentially. I'll talk about the white pulse pressure in a second. OK. OK, is the slide changing? There we go. So uh, in terms of the main two differences between distributive and non-distributive, so like I said, there's a problem with the systemic vascular resistance in the distributive shock, OK? So if you have, uh, by the way, can can you guys see my mouse? Yes, no? Lejane? Yes. Yes, perfect. OK, so uh, if you can see the, the tone, OK, yeah. Uh, OK, so the systemic vascular resistance basically represents tone. So what is tone? It's if you imagine an artery, if you have a lumen, the, which is the hole in the artery, uh, if you have a narrow lumen, you have an increase in the tone. If you have a wider lumen, you have a decrease in tone. Now, when I say there's a problem with the systemic vascular resistance, there's a problem with the tone. So there's a decrease in the tone. So if you have a decrease in the tone, then the blood vessel dilates. Okay. Now, why is this problematic? So surely, if you have a increase, uh, if you if you have a wider lumen, you should be able to get the blood flow going. That's true, but there's not enough resistance. The pressure isn't enough to get the blood flow going. So that's why it needs to be an, at an optimum resistance in order to get the blood flow going. So it can't be too. Uh, it can't have an increased tone, or it can't have a decreased tone. So in distributive shock, you have a decreased tone, OK? Now, on the other end, uh, in non-distributive, you have an increase in tone, OK? But I'll talk to you about that in a second. So what is this change in systole thing that I have here? So if you imagine the uh, normal blood pressure is uh, in any, in any uh, person is 120 over 80, OK? So 120 over 80, the 120 is systolic, the, the 80 is diastolic, okay? The change in systole is 40 because that's the, the difference between them is 40. And that's essentially the change in systole. Now, in non-distributive shock, you have an increase in the change in systole, okay? So that's, uh, so in, in distributive shock, you'll get an increase in change of systole and non-distributive shock, you'll get a decrease in the change of systole because the, in, in uh, distributive shock, you will have a uh, blood vessels dilate. So there, the cardiac output increases in order to compensate for the vascular resistance. So you'll have a wide pulse pressure in distributive shock and the in non-distributive, you'll have a narrow pulse pressure. I know this is really confusing, but once I go through the different types of shock, it, hopefully it will make more sense, okay? And the main clinical feature between the two, the way you d differentiate between the two, is in distributive, you have their, their warm. So if you go to the end of the bed and you feel their hands, okay, they will feel warm, okay? And in non-distributive, they will feel cold, okay? So the first type of shock is uh, cardiogenic shock. So in cardiogenic shock, there is a decrease in the contractility of the heart, okay? So if we go back to this equation, so there's a decrease in the contractility of the heart, you have a decrease in the stroke volume, and it's in a sense, you will have a decrease in the cardiac output, okay? So what happens with the cardiac output is it decreases, and that will cause an increase in the systemic vascular resistance to, in order to compensate to have an average uh, mean arterial pressure of uh, 65, okay? So if you have, if you have, uh, if your blood, if your heart is not pumping properly, okay, if your heart uh, is not pumping properly, eventually it's gonna lead to shock because if you can imagine, your heart uh, is the essence of the uh, of how the blood uh, flows throughout your entire body, then if that's not working, then your entire body is not working, and the common cause of that is uh, MI, so myocardial infarction or a heart attack, and another common cause is heart failure. Now, normally in an MI, uh, what happens is you get a heart attack, it's acute, you get ischemic damage to the, the heart itself, and then you give some medications, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, uh, aspirin, and then they recover. But if it's sustained and if it's long-term and you get some complications after, then you can get to cardiogenic shock, okay? That's when you start to worry, okay? Uh, so the main clinical feature of cardiogenic shock is uh, distended neck pain. So you get a raised JVP and also pulmonary edema. Okay. Uh, 
you obviously diagnose any heart condition with an ECG and you also do an echo in order to see if there's pericardial fluid. I'll go into that in one second. And the treatment is because the, the heart is constricted, constricted, you want to increase the contractility. So you use an eno dilator. So an eno basically constricts uh, on the heart and uh, increases contractility and dilator because there's so much resistance, you want to dilate the blood vessels. Uh, so th that's, that's why uh, you use an eno dilator essentially. Okay. So I just have this case study real quick. Um, if you guys know what, uh, uh, I, and just before you read the, so what is the most likely diagnosis? I want you to see two things or tell me two things that are indicative that this patient is in cardiogenic shock. Elevated jugular awareness pulse. Yeah. So that's one thing. Blood pressure. Yeah. Yeah, so blood pressure, well done. So these are the two main things. So if you have a blood pressure of 80 over 60, that's a narrow blood pressure, but he's still hypotensive. And the second thing is he's got an elevated JVP, okay, which is a sign that the patient is uh, in cardiogenic shock, okay? And the third sign is auscultation of the heart reveals heart, quite heart sound. So what is that indicative of? What's, that, what's the most likely diagnosis? Does anyone know? Tamponade. Yeah, yeah. Well done. So yeah, this is this is uh, cardiac tamponade. And if you've uh, studied the the condition, then you'd know that the something called Beck's triad. So a patient with cardiac tamponade would present with three things. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, hypotension. Second thing is elevated JVP, and third thing is uh, quiet or quiet or muffled heart sounds. So that's the sort of triad for cardiac tamponade. And what happens is normally you have the pericardial sac. There is pericardial fluid around the heart. You have overaccumulation of fluid, which causes stress on the heart. Okay, so it's outside, technically outside the heart because it's outside the heart, but it's surrounding the heart tissue and surrounding the heart muscle, which constricts the heart. And that basically impairs the venous return. It impairs the how much the heart can relax. So if, uh, if you have an impairment in the venous return and you have decreased compartment size, so the heart cannot pump efficiently because it's decreasing uh, in terms of its contractility. Okay. So that would cause uh, an increased pressure Okay, like I said, which prevents blood from getting in or getting out. So it's a two, so it's two problems both at once. Okay. Now, I'm going, I'm going to go into this soon. So it's ob subclassified into obstructive shock. So obstructive shock and cardiogenic shock sort of uh, intertwine, and uh, they both link with each other. And the reason why it's important to know about cardiac tamponade is because it's uh, it can be a complication of a cardiogenic shock, and then it can cause obstructive shock, which can cause several different problems as well. And then you treat that by urgent per pericardiosynthesis, which is, uh, if you want to read about it, it's just a it's a needle, and then they drain the blood, they drain the fluid from the uh, from the heart uh, from the sac. So yeah, this is this is exactly what happens. So yeah, in a healthy heart, you have this pericardial sac surrounding the heart, which is just a minimal amount of fluid. And then in here you get tamponade, which is literally just so much fluid that compresses the heart and prevents it from relaxing or contracting efficiently. Okay. Now an obstructive shock, it's similar to cardiogenic shock, like I said, but there's always an obstructive component. So in tamponade, that, that was the fluid obstructing the heart, which caused it to be blocked and the blood cannot be pumped forward, okay? But what you do need to know is that the signs and symptoms are the same, okay? So if, if you have a, a cardiac tamponade, the signs would be elevated JVP and that's essentially cardi card cardiogenic shock. CHF, if you have a CHF exacerbation, congestive heart failure, then that would cause uh, elevated JVP and edema, et cetera. So the signs and symptoms can be the same, but in CHF, in congestive heart failure, there is no obstructive component. Whereas in cardiac tamponade, there is, okay? Okay, everyone should know this. 
everyone, whether you're first year, final year, everyone should know this. So please shout out the diagnosis and management. No. You can see that the trachea has been is deviating to the opposite side. Yeah. Um, so it looks like a tension pneumothorax. So the first yeah. thing I would do is I'd insert a blood um, cannula into the second intercostal space midclavicular line mm -hmm. to decompress the chest, and then yeah. I'd go on to do a full AT assessment. Yeah. Yeah. Well done, Rod. So yeah, essentially this is. This is a classic tension pneumothorax, and you shouldn't even have taken this chest X-ray because uh, this patient's dying. And if you if you don't do anything, you you need to sort of relieve that pressure from uh, from the lung. So you can see that the trachea here is not central, and it's uh, deviated here because the air is pushing the the trachea, and there's a me total mediastinal shift to the to the right side. So yeah. So intention pneumothorax. The reason why it can cause an obstructive shock is because if you imagine the the lungs, okay. So if you have a mecha mechanical compression of both lungs, okay, that can cause hypoxia, okay. And then this hypoxia can cause the uh, impaired venous return because you have so much pressure inside your lungs. You have uh, the this prevents air from getting in as well. Uh, because you rely on the negative intrathoracic pressure from the outside to the inside. That's how you draw air in. So you can't even get in uh, air properly. And then you see this paradoxical rise in chest movement. And then this basically over time will cause impaired cardiac filling and the blood isn't pumped efficiently because the heart is ischemic. Okay. Okay. What is this? Any ideas? Is it a saddle embolus? Yeah, yeah, saddle pulmonary embolus, yeah. And how would you manage it, if anyone knows? So I'm not looking for any specific answers, just general. If anyone knows. Right, that's fine. Okay. So yeah, go on, Rod. I was just about to say, um, I think it just depends on how they are yeah. hemodynamically. So if they're unstable, yeah. then obviously you'd think about doing a procedure. Um, yeah. but generally speaking, you just put them on low molecular like heparin, or I think the latest guidelines say that you can even start them on a DOAC right away. Yeah. Essentially, you just you want to stop the um, thrombus from propagating any further. Yeah. So it's not about dissolving the clot, um, yes. mainly just preventing any further clots, really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well done. So yeah, this is a pulmonary embolus, and you can see it's so this is all blood, and this is a thrombus itself. It's a huge thrombus that's blocked both arteries, both the right and the left pulmonary arteries. And so it's a saddle embolus because it shaped shaped like a saddle, I guess. Uh, but you can see that it's obstructing flow from the right side and the left side. And this is another cause of obstructive shock because uh, if you have a blockage on the pulmonary arteries, that can prevent blood going to the heart and then that can obstruct blood flow to the left ventricle, essentially. So uh, that's that's why it's quite problematic and can cause uh, severe hypotension and hypoxia. Uh, and management, like Rahad said, so it was it really depends on if they're hemodynamically stable or not. You'd need to do an E2E assessment, but the main thing is you need to anticoagulate them. And uh, if if possible, if eligible, you might even thrombolize the clot. But it really depends on on their stability. Right. So I haven't covered this, but. Yeah, if you guys know, uh, so if it's a 24-year-old man, he's brought to the ED, he's rescued from a burning flat, his vital signs, uh, vital signs show a BP of 80 over 40, his heart rate's high, and temperature's stable, so of 37. He has some third-degree burns, and he's got 
he's given normal saline. So what what type of shock do you think this guy is suffering from? Is it a hypovolemic shock? Yes. Uh, well done. Yeah. So it's hypovolemic shock. So this is what I'm talking about uh, right now. So the so this is what I like to think of with hypovolemic. So three Ds and one H. So diarrhea, dehydration, diuresis, and hemorrhage. And hemorrhage can lead to obviously hemorrhagic shock. But the reason why hemorrhage is is a cause of hypovolemic shock is because blood contains water, you made a, uh, obviously. So if you're losing blood, you're losing water and you're losing fluid volume. So anything that causes loss of fluid volume is classified as hypovolemic. Okay. So this includes plasma loss, such as burns and pancreatitis, and extracellular fluid loss like DKA. And DKA can cause severe, severe, severe dehydration, which is uh, really important that you give them uh, a fluid bolus. Okay. Uh, opposite to a cardiogenic shock, uh, flat uh, you have flat neck veins. So the GV, JVP is actually non-distended. But the main finding is you have low hemoglobin and low uh, hematocrit, uh, hematocrits because they've lost so much fluids. And you can see them. You can also have some electrolyte disturbance depending on the cause. So that's why the treatment mainly revolves identifying and treating the underlying cause. So if someone's profusely dehydrated, obviously you need to give them flu uh, fluids. If uh, someone has is has severe diarrhea, then you need to give them loperamide. If someone has diuresis from giving uh, so much uh, uh, furosemide, then okay, you need to stop that furosemide uh, because that can cause uh, kidney damage. So it really depends on what the main cause of the hypovolemic shock is, okay? And obviously you have supportive measures, so you can raise the legs and elevate the head of the bed, etc. So just to uh, keep the, the fluid going, okay? But the main thing is you need to give them fluids, okay? So most of shock involves giving fluids. Most shock types are managed with fluids. So if you're stuck in a question and you're not sure what to do, you give them fluids. But this one in particular, you need to, you need to give them fluids because otherwise they're just they're going to deteriorate, deteriorate really rapidly. Okay. Uh, if they're if they're uh, stable after one shot, uh, one or two shots, uh, two two boluses of fluid, then that's good. Otherwise, then you refer them to ICU for uh, so, uh, for extra measures, which I'll cover later on. Now, with hemorrhagic shock, uh, the main etiology is trauma. Okay. So so if 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 you get an injury and there's blood loss and you're losing, you keep on losing blood, you keep on losing blood, you're gonna go, go into shock, okay? Uh, so some examples include tension in motorax, spinal cord injury, myocardial contusion, cardiac tamponade. So all of these are traumatic incidents that can lead to hemorrhagic shock. So any of these can be caused from example, motor vehicle accidents, road traffic accidents, uh, you know, having something crushed, being crushed onto you uh, or a stab wound, or even a gunshot wound. So all of these are traumatic incidents that can cause hemorrhagic shock. And obviously you need to stop the bleeding, you give them fluids, you find out what blood type they are, and then, they, and then you need to give them blood immediately, okay? And the last thing is just FFP with red cells. That's just an extra thing that, uh, if they're depleted for uh, platelets and fibrinogen. So you, you get some bloods, you check what they missed out on, and if they missed out on, uh, that specific uh, blood. So if they if they have uh, low platelets, low fibrinogen, then you aim to replace that essentially. So it replace what you've lost. Now this is the types of shock uh, that I was uh, like. Uh, obviously, you need you don't need to know them by heart, but the way I split it is class one and two is sort of mild, moderate, and then class three and four is moderate, severe. So class one and two is, uh, the, the reason why I classify that as mild moderate is because here, if you check the systolic blood pressure, so, sorry, it's not clear, but the systolic blood pressure in class one and two, there is no change. So the blood pressure is still high enough that they're not classified as hypotensive. Whereas in class three and four, okay, they're hypotensive, they're very tachycardic, their heart rate's high, they've lost a third of their blood, that's a lot. So that's that's basically going to cause uh, confusion, drowsiness, uh, and sort of uh, altered mental status. Um, in terms of the uh, sources of bleeding, uh, I always like to 
think of it as on the floor and four more. So the on the uh, on the floor is basically external bleeding, and four more is the internal bleeding, which is from the chest, the abdomen, the pelvis, and the extremities. And that's just uh, a way to think of how uh, or or sort of uh, where the blood is coming from. Okay. Now we so all these so hypovolemic, hemorrhagic, cardiogenic, and obstructive. All of these were the non-distributive uh, shock types. So now I'm going to just talk about the septic and the distributive shock. So sepsis and septic shock is the most important one, and you always hear about it in the wards because any age group uh, can get it, and it's 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 really really bad if you get it and really worrying. So sepsis is just an infection. Okay, so it's infection, it's life-threatening, and essentially what happens is if you have a single organ, for example, uh, the kidneys, the kidneys get infected, uh, you get something called pyelonephritis, that can spread into sepsis, so there is bacteria in the blood, and then that can cause septic shock, which is multi-organ failure, and that can sometimes need ICU uh, treatment, which is really, really bad. Uh, the way you identify it is uh, a lactate more than two, or if you give some fluids and they're still not responding and they need vasopressors to maintain sort of a high mean arterial pressure of 65, then you're starting to think, okay, this person is in septic shock. So does anyone know the criteria used for identifying sepsis? Yes, no. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's used, begins with us. No? Right, okay. Okay, so the criteria used is called uh, SIRS. So that's the previous criteria that's been used. Um, it's the, uh, it's basically based on four things, either having a high temperature or low temperature, having a heart rate of more than 90, tachypnea, so having a high respiratory rate and uh, also a high white cell count or low white cell count. So these are sort of the main uh, features or the main uh, things that are used to diagnose someone with uh, sepsis. So if a patient has sepsis, then they'll have all four of these plus an evidence of infection, okay? Now, I'm not sure if this is true, but uh, based on what I've been told is that they've been starting to use this new criteria called QSOFA, uh, but this is only used outside of ICU. So if someone has a respiratory rate more than 22, altered mental status, blood pressure less than 100, then they're considered to have uh, sepsis as well. Uh, but Generally, if you go in the wards and you mention SARS, so systemic inflammatory response syndrome, that's that's the criteria that they use to determine if a patient is septic. And I'm sure we've all heard of this, the sepsis six or buffalo or three in, three out. So there are several different ways that you treat sepsis or you manage sepsis. The main thing is wh whichever way you want to learn, you, you need to know it, okay? So it, it, whether that's give three, uh, so three in, three out, or, uh, uh, sorry, a buffalo, then you need to know it. So the main, th the main one that I use is three in, three out, or give three, take three. So that's antibiotics, oxygen, fluids. So you give that all at once, and then take three. So you need to measure the lactate, you need to measure the urine output, you need to check blood clutches. So lactate more than two is bad, urine output more than, uh, less than 0 0.5 is bad, and blood cultures determining uh, if there is an organism within the blood, so that's bacterium, but that's also really bad. And you need to give these three, obviously, to uh, manage the sepsis, okay? Okay, do we have any questions so far? Because I've been talking for quite a bit. I have a question, if that's okay. Go on. Uh, would you use news for, um, I mean, instead of um, SERS? Uh, potentially. Um, it depends what the news criteria is. Uh, so, so what parts of the news uh, that's being affected. So what I hear is that, okay, obviously if a patient is in sepsis 
then they would have a higher news score. But in general, you can't really use the news score as a determining factor that this patient is in sepsis because it could just be acutely unwell. It could be, it could have a high news score because of, um, let's say, uh, another type of shock, like he's bleeding or something. So it's not a good criteria for sepsis exactly. Okay. Right. So then the, uh, the other distributive shock type uh, that I really want to talk about is anaphylactic shock. So anaphylaxis is basically if you if you're, if you're exposed to an allergen like nuts uh, or peanuts or whatever, and you get a response, you get an autoimmune response, type 1 IgE mediated, and that's going to cause release of histamine, and that's going to literally just obstruct your airway. It's going to cause a rash. It's going to cause you to be really, really unwell. So with anaphylactic shock, it's really important to spot it because a patient can die within minutes, uh, depending obviously on how bad the, the airway obstruction is. Now, uh, interestingly, if a patient, so I have a question for you guys. I don't know if you would know, but uh, if uh, if a patient has uh, a rash, okay, and he has a uh, swelling of the hands, the limbs uh, of the hands, uh, the feet, the the mouth, uh, and a really really uh, wheezy chest, okay, would that be considered anaphylaxis? Does anyone know? Okay. I think because you mentioned that they're quite wheezy, um, you're really concerned. You, I think you'd call it anaphylaxis if, like you said, it sounds very concerning. So it's not just the rash and the swelling, but they're short of breath. Um, you might notice that their blood, blood pressure is dropping and they're quite tachypneic. Um, that's when I would call it anaphylaxis. Whereas if it was just like a skin rash and, and a bit of swelling, I, but they were breathing just fine, I wouldn't rush, I wouldn't jump to give them adrenaline. Yeah. Um, so that's just what I think, to be honest. Yeah, so that's a logical explanation. But interestingly, when I was in the wards and I saw a pediatric patient and she had uh, all the features that I described, but she didn't have any airway edema or airway obstruction, and she wasn't hypotensive, she wasn't in shock, she was considered just to have an allergic reaction and she was just given uh, hydrocortisone. So she was classified as just having an allergic reaction. So the main thing that you need to know is if, uh, if a patient has airway edema, so airway obstruction and hypotension, that's anaphylaxis. If he doesn't have, if he or she do, doesn't have that, doesn't have those two, then it's not anaphylaxis. It's just an allergic reaction. No matter how bad their chest sounds, no matter how much the edema is, no matter how much in pain they are, but because it's not affecting their, their airway directly and it's not affecting their blood pressure directly, then it's not anaphylaxis, okay? So, but in, in terms of anaphylactic shock, so back to back to the anaphylactic shock itself. So it's sudden onset, respiratory, cardiovascular compro compromise, and there's usually a history of allergen. So if they've been exposed to nuts or something else or food allergy, uh, then th they, they will get severely ill in a very, very, very short amount of time. And they would require uh, either an EpiPen uh, or a journalin. So the way you diagnose it is something called tryptase levels. So obviously this is done after the the after they're stable. You won't just take the bloods there right there then. So you would need to stabilize them, and then afterwards you would uh, take the serum tryptase levels, and they would usually be elevated. And another thing is you would obviously in terms of treatment you would secure the airway, so establish the airway, lie them flat, raise the legs, give them adrenaline. So usually it's in the form of one to 1,000 intramuscularly. So either in the uh, buttocks or wherever suitable. Uh, and yeah, that's that's how you essentially treat them. They should recover quite quickly. Now, in terms of the other types of shock. So there are several other types um, that I wanted to mention. Uh, I won't go into 
severe detail because they can be quite complex and I honestly don't understand them fully so I won't co complicate you or myself. Um, so the, the main two are spinal shock and neurogenic. So spinal shock is when you have neurons uh, periphery, so in your hands or uh, wherever, uh, not centrally, not in the spinal cord, they become unresponsive and it's sort of an immediate loss of power, sensation and reflexes, okay, where they can't feel anything below the level of injury. So if they've, if they've injured, for example, their back, uh, either from falling and the elderly and there's a nerve uh, injury, then anything below that can cause a uh, diminished sensation, total uh, loss of power sensation reflexes. And it's quite sudden and immediate. Whereas neurogenic, it's, it's uh, with more in the central and sympathetic nervous system because you get a disruption of the, of the autonomic pathways. So that can be so a gunshot wound, so to the spinal cord. Um, now they're very similar and they could be similar in terms of the causes, but it's just the way they present, it could be different. Uh, but in terms of the main difference between these types of shocks and the other types of shock is that with this one, you get bradycardia. So you get a diminished heart rate compared to all the other types of shock. You get an increase in heart rate as compensation. Whereas this one, because it's a disruption of the autonomic pathways, that's going to decrease the heart rate uh, as a result. Okay. And the final one is Addisonian crisis. So this is basically when you have uh, adrenal insufficiency uh, uh, due to Addison's disease. So you don't have uh, you don't have enough cortisol. That's why cortisol is such an important hormone. And if you don't have enough, then that's going to cause hypotension, hypoglycemia, hyperkalemia, and hyponatremia, um, which uh, yeah, which is a form of shock uh, in the end. Okay. And finally is uh, treatments of shock. So the main treatments, uh, so I mentioned before, one of them was uh, dobutamine. So uh, dobutamine works on, uh, works effectively if it's congestive heart failure because you want to increase the contractility and you want to <coughs> uh, decrease the systemic vascular resistance. Uh, and that's how dobutamine works uh, in the end, but that's used more on the uh, severe side of things. Now, those two are used in different causes. So in vaso, uh, vasoconstriction, so such as phenylephrine, adrenaline, vasopressin. So that's used for stuff like anaphylactic or spinal shock because uh, you have an increase in the uh, blood pressure. Okay, so it increases the blood pressure and it lowers the heart rate. Phenylephrine specifically is used in anesthesia as well. So if, uh, if a patient's blood pressure, blood pressure is dropping down, they can actually increase the blood pressure by uh, increase uh, by using phenylephrine. Okay, uh, in general anesthesia. And finally is uh, inotropes. So this one's mostly used for sepsis. Uh, the weird one is dopamine. So dopamine actually works uh, on these specific receptors. So the beta one, and alpha one, and it actually is good to constrict uh, the blood vessels in order to uh, get more blood flow going, uh, especially to the peripheries and, and uh, prevent ischemia. Uh, but this is more used in like septic shock and uh, in ICU. So you wouldn't give it normally to any septic patient. So yeah, that's all I have in terms of the content. So uh, I was going, yeah, so we have enough time for one or two case studies. So I will make up the scenarios and you guys We'll sort of talk to me about them. Uh, if you do, you have any questions so far, though, about the presentation or anything else? No. Right. Okay. Okay. So I have a case study. So let's say I am a. Thirty-four-year-old uh, man who's uh, come into the A&E because he sustained a uh, after being crushed by a tractor tire. Yeah, I know it sounds weird, but it's being he's being crushed by a tractor tire, and he the the in terms of the mechanism. So you can see that. Uh, 
so he's he's been brought in by a uh, uh, he, he's been brought in by the ambulance, by the paramedics. He's been stabilized, so his spine was stable, and he's been crushed, and you can see a crush injury on his pelvis, okay? Now, on examination, so you can see his vitals. His heart rate is 120, okay? Uh, let's say 140. His heart rate is 140. His uh, blood pressure is 80 over 60 and you can see blood coming out from the pelvic side uh the from the right pelvis and then uh so you try to stop the bleeding and then uh you give him saline okay so what type of shock first of all what type of shock would this be hemorrhagic yeah so hemorrhagic okay what could it also be? Hypovolemic. Yeah, yeah. So hypovolemic. Yeah. So remember, hypovolemic, the most important fluid in, uh, or the most important. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So blood is basically consists of water. So if you're losing blood, you're losing uh, fluid volume. So you're losing water. So that's why it can be both. Okay. So okay. How would you manage this patient? So, okay, you've given him saline. What else would you do? I would cross match them. Yeah, cross match them. Yeah. So Order. he's lost. So he's lost one and a half liters of blood. Do we know what his HB is? Yeah, his HB is uh, sixty. Um, so I think one bag bumps it up by 10. Yeah. Um, let's just say we're going to order four units, I think, of cross-matched blood. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then after you order the, the, the bag, so, okay, he's stable now. What are you going to do after? So you've... So, so he he can't move his pelvis. Um, I think he needs a pelvic binder just to try to minimize any more uh, yeah. blood loss. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then I'm assuming that we've already done ATE. We've reassessed. Yeah. We've, and then hand yes. over as as far to your seniors because he's going to need, um, I think some sort of surgical intervention. Yeah, yeah. So most likely he sustained a fracture. And so you would need to do a CT scan to confirm that fracture and then call orthopedics just to see if, uh, you know, what's, what sort of procedure they'd have. But uh, th this is obviously after he's hemodynamically uh, stable. Right. And just one more. So I've got a patient that's, um, so she's got, uh, she's a 42 year old uh, lady with uh, a history of uh, sorry, uh, nephrogenic calcinosis. So this is a rare kidney condition where uh, you get recurrent uh, stones. So she's coming now. She has a, an infected uh, kidney. So she has been diagnosed with pyelonephritis, OK? So on examination, her heart rate is 130. Her blood pressure is 70 over 30 and her uh, her respiratory rate is uh, 32. So, and temperature is 38.5. So what are the things that you need to do now? So she's coming. She's got a high temperature. She's got a high respiratory rate. She's she's got pyelonephritis, which is an infection in the kidneys, and she's hemodynamically unstable. So first of all, what type of shock is it? <clears throat> Septic shock. Yeah. Okay. So how would you manage this? A little bit. With buffalo. Yeah. Okay. So what are the things you do? Buffalo. Three in, three out. Uh, you take. Blood cultures. 
Mm -hmm. uh, urine output, yeah. lactate, and yeah. given that it's uh, fluid and oxygen. Yeah. Okay. So, how much? Uh, well, how? Okay. Uh, her lactate is two, two point two. Her lactate. Her uh, blood cultures reveal uh, E. coli. Okay. And her, uh, what was the third thing? Uh, her urinary output is, uh, let's say, 400 mils in 400, uh, 400, 400 mils in, or 200 mils in 24 hours. <clears throat> so how much, so what would you do in terms of the fluids, the oxygen, and the, uh, uh, the antibiotic. So, what? What? How, so, which antibiotic would you start her on, for example? Follow local guidelines. Yes, follow local <laughs> guidelines. Yes, well done. So you can never be too sure. If 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 you're if you're unsure, always just say uh, follow local guidelines. It's, it's it keeps on changing. But if if you're thinking of something. Think about something broad spectrum. So it starts with a calf, uh, cephalosporin, or something like that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in terms of oxygen and fluids, so how would you manage that? She's going to need to be catheterized because we need to know yeah. how much we're putting in and how much she's yeah. uh, essentially peeing out. Yeah. Um, the only thing I would add is always remember when you say blood cultures, always say urine cultures as well. And that yeah. you would do that ideally if. If possible, you do the cultures before giving them antibiotics. Yeah. Just as an extra, just make sure you always say that. And then an OSCE, okay. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you've given oxygen, you've given fluids. Her lactate, uh, her lactate is uh, going down a bit, uh, but it's still around two-ish. Okay. And her blood pressure is still, I would say, uh, 80 over 40. What would you do then? So you've given have everything. We, you've, you... you've done Buffalo. You've done Buffalo. What did you do after? Um, in terms of the fluids, have we given her a bolus? Yeah, yeah. we've given her fluid. Yeah. So you've Has given her Buffalo. So her, she's still hypotensive. She's hemodynamically safe, unstable. What would you do then? Uh, if she doesn't have a history of like heart failure, um, then I would try giving her another bolus, see if okay. she responds. Yeah, yeah. She's um, still not responding. What did you after? Uh, get your senior to come around. Yeah. Get, get your senior. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, after you've given two fluid boluses and she's not responding, then you most likely need to take her to ICU uh, because if she's if she's not responding you need to take her to icu she will need some sort of vasopressor or extra requirements like extra oxygen extra treatment methods and you can't just keep her on the ward so one thing to learn from this whole uh, this this uh, presentation is okay if you're not sure consult a senior uh if, if you're not sure of the antibiotic uh take uh, uh, check local guidelines but if someone is deteriorating, always think, okay, what's the next step? What's the next step? So if you've, if you've done this, if you've done the correct steps then think, okay, I'll call senior, I'll take them to ICU because they're really, really sick. So shock is not something that you just need to keep the patient in the bay or you need to keep the ward, you need to keep them on the ward. You need to act quickly and you need to take them to ICU if all else fails and if, if they have a chance of surviving, okay? So I hope I covered most of what you guys expected. Um, if you guys need me to explain anything else, do let me know. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I'll end it there. Any other questions? Thank you. That was really useful. No worries. Yeah, thanks. I'll, that was very useful. Thank I'll you very much. Send the. Yeah, I'll take it out. Here. Uh, I'll send the uh, feedback if you guys could just fill that out.